Okay, I think we can get started. Hello, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everyone, depending on where you might be logging in from. I am Rob Burgess, and I head up business development for Sino Biological. And I would like to welcome you all to the next installment in our webinar series hosted by Sino Biological called BioTalk Tuesday. We have an excellent webinar and speaker today uh, focused on cellular understimulation and the regulation of disease progression. Before we get to that, though, and I introduce the speaker, I want to let everybody know that we have one housekeeping issue, and that is we ask you all, number one, to introduce yourselves in the chat box and tell us where you're from. And then number two, if you have questions for our speaker, just ask those questions in the chat box and we will withhold all questions till the end of the seminar. And then I will walk through and ask verbally those of our speaker as many of those questions as I can. So please introduce yourselves, say where you're from, put your questions in the chat box and we'll get to them after the seminar. Um, so without further ado, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to everyone this week's Esteemed speaker, it is Dr. Justin Perino. Dr. Perino is an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences and the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Delaware. His lab aims to understand the role that actin cytoskeleton plays in diverse diseases, such as tendinosis, osteoarthritis, and cataracts. And the overall vision of his lab is to one day develop actin-based therapeutics against diseases. The Pareto lab specifically uses a complement of in vivo to in vitro approaches and studies, and also studies load transmission from the macro to the nano scale. Uh, in addition to Dr. Pareto's role as an assistant professor, he also serves on the editorial board of several leading scientific journals, and is the undergraduate research director for his department. The title of Dr. Perino's talk today is, as you can see, Cellular Understimulation Reduces F-Actin to Regulate Disease Progression in Tendinosis. And with that, Dr. Perino, welcome today, and we will hand over the screen sharing to you. Great. Thank you very much, Rob and Max, for the, uh, for the kind uh, invitation to present here at uh, BioTalk Tuesday, um, as well as Lilith, who, who uh, gave my name forth for the suggestion um, for me to give a BioTalk Tuesday, uh, who I know is in the audience right now. Mm -hmm. So um, can, you guys, can you all hear me okay, Rob? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sounds good. Perfect. Uh, so as Rob said, the title of my talk is Cellular Understimulation Reduces F-Actin to Regulate Disease Progression and Tendinosis. Um, as you can tell by the title um, here, F-actin, it's, it's the protein that we study. So F-actin is an abundant and ubiquitous protein expressed in cells. Uh, just a little recap of what actin is. It is a globular monomeric protein that nucleates and polymerizes to form a filamentous F-actin structure. Now this F-actin is stabilized at both ends by capping proteins. At the pointed end, a family of tropomodulins bind and stabilize F-actin. And at the barbed end, there are a host of proteins that bind and stabilize F-actin there, uh, such as CAPZ. Um, along the F-actin filament, a family of proteins called the tropomyosins, which will become important for, for the sake of this talk, bind along F-actin to stabilize F-actin. Now, tropomyosins are regarded as master regulators of F-actin. Not only do they stabilize F-actin, but they also have the ability to regulate the binding of other actin binding proteins, such as the capping proteins, onto F-actin, as well as other proteins, um, such as uh, severing proteins or cross-linking proteins. So the trop tropomyosins are regarded as master regulators. Now, this basic F-actin unit then assembles into higher order structures, to determine cell structures, such as the contractile ring during cytokinesis, the lamellopodia in motile cells, the muscle sarcomeres to allow for contraction of muscles, 
and specialized structures, such as the microvilli of the small intestine. My lab studies the actin cytoskeleton. So we're, we're focused on cellular structure, in particular the actin cytoskeleton, in its role in regulating tissue function. Now we study a diverse set of tissues, um, namely tendon, cartilage, and the ocular lens. And we're interested in understanding how actin may play a role in the disease pathogenesis, such as tendinosis, osteoarthritis, and cataracts or presbyopia. We're, understand, we're, we're aimed at understanding how actin regulates the progression of the diseases to one day develop actin-based therapeutics. So we want to gain novel insights into specific actin network molecules that can actually be targeted during osteoarthritis, tendinosis, and cataracts. For the sake of this talk, we're gonna be focusing in on tendinosis and our tendon work. Now this is done in collaboration with Dr. Don Elliott's group here at the University of Delaware in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Now as an introduction to tendons, they are rope-like structures consisting of um, collagen, namely type one collagen, and they connect muscle to bone. So as the muscles contract, they pull on the bone to create movement. What you see here is a leg, and here you have your calf muscle or soleus muscle and gastrocnemius. This attaches to the calcaneus through the Achilles tendon, which is the largest tendon in the body. In addition to the Achilles, there's also another tendon that connects the soleus to the calcaneus, and this is the plantaris. It's a sm much smaller tendon, and most of the load is distributed through the Achilles, and this becomes um, important later, uh, this, this particular anatomy. But as the soleus muscle contracts, it pulls on the Achilles tendon and the plantaris tendon to move the calcaneus or heel, allowing you to flex your foot. Now, as I mentioned, tendons are made out of collagen. So collagen molecules, triple helical collagen, assemble to form these collagen fibrils. There's a hierarchical structure. These fibrils then um, combine to form fibers. And these fibers finally come together to form a tendon fascicle. Now within the tendon fascicle and between the fibers are tendon cells. And what you see here is second harmonic imaging to see the collagen fibrils. And along those fibrils, you see stained in green here are the tenocytes. So these tenocytes are lined along the fibrils. They are highly elongated cells. Now these cells are important in interacting with a matrix. Um, and they exist in a, a, a physiological matrix homeostasis, such that under physiological conditions, there's a natural turnover of matrix molecules. They're producing, the cells are producing anabolic as well as catabolic factors. These anabolic factors are things such as collagen type 1 and tenase and C, which form up the tendon matrix. Uh, intracellular molecules, such as alpha spin muscle actin, which allows for contractility of cells and allows for the resiliency of the cells. And transcription factors, such as chloraxis, which is responsible for the expression of collagen type 1 and tenase and C. There are also imbalanced with catabolic factors, namely the matrix metalloproteases, which degrade collagen, atom TSs and cathepsins, which also are able to degrade other matrix molecules. Now, unfortunately, during tendinosis, there's an imbalance in this matrix homeostasis such that there's a predominance of catabolic factors. Anabolic factors such as collagen 1, tenase, and C, alpha small sac and scleraxis are reduced during tendinosis, whereas there's an increase in the expression of matrix metalloproteases and other proteolytic, proteolytic enzymes. In addition to the production of these catabolic factors, there's also the production of ectopic cartilage matrix. So not only are they producing less tendon matrix and degrading tendon matrix by the production of catabolic factors, but they're also producing matrix that shouldn't be there, such as cartilage matrix, which will increase the stiffness of the tissue. This will lead to um, loss of biomechanical function. Now, important for the matrix homeostasis of the tendon is mechanical loading. So as you can see here in tennis players, such as the number one ranked tennis player today, Carlos Alcaraz, mechanical loading does play a role in his muscle size. So you can see that he's right-handed, so he has much larger right arm muscles than his left, but also his tendon structure would also be different from his left. 
they would be there his collagen fibrils would be much larger and would he would have a much more robust right arm tendon so here anabolic factors predominate over catabolic factors causing an increase in the the increase in tissue structure or increase in the size of tissue structure now on the opposite end of the spectrum when there's underloading or under stimulation of the tendon there are there is a predominance of catabolic factors which will lead to pathological changes to the tendon so such a space flight here so this space flight leads to tissue degradation and these are mice that are that have been um, brought to space they're they're they don't exist in gravity so so what happens here is that the tendons start to degrade because there's a lack of mechanical stimulation their tendons begin to increase in production of matrix metalloproids 13 and 3. this leads to a decrease in um, also the amount of collagen that's produced and leads to decreased collagen fibril diameters and um, a decrease in the size of the tendon so mechanical forces play a role in determining um, the cartilage or the tendon matrix homeostasis. Now, tendinosis is regarded as an overuse or overload um, path pathology of tendon. Um, so, if you pipette a lot and you overuse your your thumb, you can experience tendinosis in your in your thumb. Um, but this can also happen with weightlifting. Um, that could be done or due to overuse. It can also be due to overload lifting too heavy a weights. Um, as well as jump training, for instance, here, that can be um, prone to tendinosis of the Achilles tendon. Now, in repetitive stress injuries that you might experience um, with repetitive uh, pipetting, for instance, um, that often results in painful tendinosis. So you, a patient would experience a lot of pain. However, strength training tendinosis is often asymptomatic. So this is due, likely due to overload. And in sports players that do a lot of jump training, they also might experience tendinosis, but this is also asymptomatic. So with that, that's really interesting because what might happen is even though they, are, they have tendinosis, they may not be experiencing pain, but this may still lead to degradation of your tendon and eventually lead to rupture. So in sports players such as basketball players that do a lot of jump training, um, they may experience tendinosis. They might not know about it. Um, or they, they may be undergoing tendinosis, may not know about it, and this can actually lead to ruptures, such as the Achilles tendon tear, which has been um, thought to be a killer of careers. Um, but now with, with new rehab techniques, um, players such as Kevin Durant here can return to a high level of play. So it is important to understand uh, this distinction between load and frequency. Um, and I think this figure sums it up well. So this was... Um, this was made by Ellen Bloom, who was a former PhD student in Don Elliott's lab. And what we show here is on the x-axis, the number of cycles, on the y-axis, load. In the green circle here is physiological homeostasis, so not much tendon change here. In the light green, you have tendon adaptation. So what you see here is that with a high number of cycles, there can be an adaptation, such as positive changes uh, to your tendon. Um, this is, can also be during uh, running as well, where there's an increase in the number of cycles, but as well as load. There can also be positive adaptation with regard to strength training. So a high amount of load, not necessarily a, an increase in um, the number of cycles, but still you get a positive change um, to your tendon. However, if you surpass this uh, physiological region, you, you enter this blue region here, um, which is pathology. And pathology can happen with a lack of loading, such as space flight or immobilization, where there's low loads and low cycles. Um, or in this case, where there's an overload, so there's a high load and a low number of cycles. So we wanted to understand um, how overload, since it's the asymptomatic um, or likely the asymptomatic version of um, tendinosis, may impact um, tendons. So there are mouse models or animal models that um, look at how overuse can contribute to tendinosis, and this is um, quite common in our field, like treadmill running. However, overload is typically the more understudied um, mechanism of disease. So if we just isolate load here, what we're suspecting is that overload past a certain point 
probably about 9% will lead to tendinosis. But a decrease in load will lead to the same thing. During this physiological adaptation, if there's overload, there's an increase in collagen type 1, um, a decrease in MMP, MMPs, MMP3 and MMP13. But once you pass this threshold of overload, you would expect there to be an increase in MMP3 and 13. But when there's a decrease beyond a certain threshold of load, there will also be a pathological response and an increase in MMPs. So we wanted to study what happens with overload. So there have been um, in vitro studies that have um, looked at the effect of loading on cells. So these are some classical studies that have been performed over 20 years ago. This is a flex cell study. And in this study, what they did here was they seeded tenocytes, tenon cells onto loading, uh, uh, rubber membranes. So this is a six well dish. It's a side view of one six well dish. The cells are seated onto this rubber membrane over top of this loading post. Now to apply load onto the cells, vacuum pressure drives airflow in, resulting in pulling onto this rubber membrane over top of this loading post, causing stretch on the cells. And what they found was that by applying stretch as compared to the control cells, there's an increase in the production of matrix metalloproteinase 3. Now you can get this increase in matrix metalloproteinase 3 by also treating with inflammatory cytokine interleukin 1 beta. So here you can see there's an increase in matrix metalloproteinase 3 as well as 1 with stimulation by interleukin. Now in conjunction, if you apply stretch and interleukin, you see an even greater increase in the production of matrix metalloproteases MP1 and 3. Here's another classical study of stretching tendon cells. Um, and this is taking actually a, a tail tendon tissue. So you just take a tail tendon tissue, you suspend it using an alligator clip on a 50 mil conical tube. On the other end, you have another alligator clip that's attached to a weight. So it's applying static load onto this tendon, causing stretch on the tendon cells. What you see here is that on your freshly isolator that came from mechanically stretched environment, there is very little MMP1 or no MMP1 being produced. However, if you stress deprived and have no weights hanging onto the, the tendon, there's an increase in the expression of matrix metalloproteinase 1. So this is, this is opposite to what we're finding here, where stretch, um, stretch increases um, the matrix metalloproteases. Here, when you apply the stretch, there's actually reduction in the amount of MMP1 that's being produced. Intriguingly, if you apply stretch and treat the tendons with cytoclasin D, which is an actin depolymerization agent, this actually recovers the amount of matrix metalloproteinase that's produced. Um, and this is the first suggestion to me that the actin cytoskeleton may be involved in regulating the response of stretch. So in this case, we see that overloading results in the production um, or repression of matrix metalloproteinase. So overloading can cause or loading the cells can cause increases in matrix metalloproteases, but so can underloading. In another study, uh, more recent, this study utilizes um, a, a much more sophisticated instrument to apply stretch onto cells. So what happens here is tendons are screwed under this clamp here and this clamp tendon, tail tendons are um, placed within between these two screws and stretched. They are able to apply cyclical stretch as this um, apparatus is connected to an actuator and you can hold stretch in at, at different magnitudes. So what they found was that in the untreated condition, which was freshly isolated tendons that came from a mechanical environment, F-actin was aligned, the cells were aligned. You can see this by F-actin staining as well as the nuclei here, they're relatively aligned. However, in the stress deprived or where cells or tendons were kept in the free floating condition, so just floating in culture media, you see that the cells began to round up, they're no longer elongated, and the nuclei also began to round up and become a little bit more disorganized. Now, if you mechanically load the tendon tissues, they remained aligned, as you can tell by the F-actin staining, as well as um, the staining for the nuclei. The nuclei also remained elongated, just like the cells do. 
With regard to gene expression, if you stress the prive tendons, you again see a decrease in collagen type 1. Another tenogenic molecule, tenomodulin, is reduced. Um, Sclerascus unchanged, but what you see is an increase, a quite drastic increase in the production of a catabolic gene, matrix metalloproteinase 3. And if you apply stretch, this represses the decrease in collagen type 1, tenomodulin. This increases um, Sclerascus production and decreases the expression of matrix metalloproteinase 3. So again, here, applying stretch is favorable and um, it prevents matrix degradation. So this is interesting because overloading, what I've shown you here is that with the, with the in vitro cellular loading, which caused overloading the cells, this resulted in an increase in matrix metalloproteinase production, but underloading tissue resulted in a, a um, increase in matrix metalloproteinase production as well. So let's return back to this in vitro study where cells are cultured on the rubber membranes and stretched. In this study, they applied cellular strains of 8%. So they applied 8% stretch onto cells. Now, if we think about the in vivo condition where tendon cells are within a tendon matrix, a lot of that matrix will shield the cells from actually experiencing stretch. So in, in, um, in the in vivo condition, 8% cellular strain is nearly impossible to actually get onto the cells. About a 30% strain on a tissue will actually only lead to load transmission of 4 to 6% on the cells. Um, so 8% cellular strain, although it's overload, it would be very difficult to achieve in vivo. So this leads us to our paradox. Tenocyte mechanical stimulation we know is essential to maintain tendon homeostasis. And while it was once speculated that overload of, um, overload of tendon tissue leads to overstimulation of tenocytes, <clears throat> we know that to overstimulate tenocytes, this would be very challenging in an in vivo situation. So an alternative hypothesis is that tendon overload actually leads to a paradoxical stress deprivation or understimulation of tenocytes. So I wasn't the first person to come up with this hypothesis. And I believe it was Arnoxki et al. Um, so in this particular hypothesis, what is suggested is that tendon overload, stretch on the tissue, overloading the tissue, would actually disrupt the matrix cellular interaction between the matrix and cells, resulting in the cells no longer being able to experience the load on the tendon tissue. So if you're ten, uh, stretching, the tendon, the matrix cells interaction is no longer there. So the cells are no longer experiencing the day-to-day -day stretch that the tendon is experiencing. Now, while this is a hypothesis, there have been limited studies to actually study this in vivo. So Don Elliott's group, in collaboration with Don Elliott's group, we developed um, a synergistic ablation model to study tendon overload. So I return, I return here to the anatomy of um, this time a rat. And what you see here is the soleus muscle of a rat. This is a calcanus. The Achilles tendon is right here, connecting to the calcanus. And this is the plantaris tendon, that smaller tendon. Again, most of the load is transmitted from the soleus to the, um, to the calcanus through the Achilles tendon. Um, there, are, there is load uh, transferred from the plantaris, but um, very little. So for our model, what we did was we transected the Achilles and ablated the Achilles such that all the load was now transmitted through the plantaris tendon, overloading the plantaris tendon. Now, Ellen did some, um, some activity monitoring. And what Ellen found was that there was no difference between, uh, between rats that had undergone the synab surgery um, sham surgery, or that were left um, uh, untouched. So there was no, no um, difference in the normalized total distance that the, that the rats traveled um, over time, over eight week period. Um, also the number of rings, the amount of time that they spent on the hind limbs isn't any different in any of the conditions. So we believe that this is truly an overload model where uh, there's no difference in the activity or the number of cycles um, that the tendon is experiencing. 
So our first question is to determine whether or not Synab actually um, leads to cellular understimulation. So does this Synab induced tendon overload lead to cellular understimulation? To do this, Ellen performed serial block face scanning electron microscopy. So thin serial sections were, were taken. Um, this is the intact tendon. And what you see here is a cell. It's, it's um, elongated, but this is a cross section of the tendon. You can see um, also the cellular projections here. Um, these are the collagen fibrils. And what you can notice is that the collagen fibrils are really close and abutted to the tendon cell or the tenocyte. However, in the synab condition, you see that the cell has rounded up. And you can see that the collagen fibrils are, are larger and they are no longer abutted to the cell. So this may suggest that there's some sort of extracellular space um, where loading the tendon will now um, lead to understimulation on the cells because mechanical forces can no longer be transmitted from the fibrils onto the cells. So mechanical forces are likely no longer transmitted onto the cells um, we know from the in vitro studies that actin may play a role in this. The next question was, is actin affected? So we then did longitudinal sections on the rat tendons. Um, so this, these are longitudinal sections of the plantaris tendon. We stain for F-actin using phylloidin and G-actin using DNase 1. F-actin stained here in red, G-actin is stained here in green. And what you see here is in the control condition, the red signal, the F-actin signal predominates. However, three days after Synab surgery, what you see here is that the G-actin signal predominates, suggesting that there is depolymerization of F-actin. So now there's more globular actin um, and an overall destabilization of F-actin. So does this stress deprivation actually destabilize F-actin? We wanted to test this in a more thorough way. So we, we turned to an ex vivo study. Now this study was conducted in my lab by um, a talented undergrad, Cameron and Guido. And what he did was he removed mouse tails, isolated the tendon fascicles. So he, these are fascicles here. You can just pull them quite readily out of the, the, the tail. And you can place these tendons in, in culture. So this, this is floating culture of tendon. Now, tendons coming from um, freshly isolated from the, the mouse right after sacrifice would come from a mechanically loaded environment. And we can compare that to tendons that have been in culture for a period of one or two days, which is the understimulated environment. We first looked at F-actin. Um, we developed a methodology to do whole mound staining um, for F and G-actin on the tail tendons that are either freshly isolated from the mechanically loaded stretched environment or that were in floating stress deprived conditions for one or two days. What you see here is that after one day, there's an increase in the amount of G-actin in the tendon, similar to our Synab studies. So higher mag, um, higher mag image is shown here. You can see that there's much more green signal. In addition, if we magnify these box regions even more and look at a single optical slice, um, you can see that tendons are aligned in the freshly isolated tendon, but after one day, the cells rounded up quite a bit. We performed ratio metric analysis to figure out the proportion of G to F actin here. Um, again, this is GDF actin, so staining for DNase 1 and phylloidin. And our ratio metric quantitative imaging analysis demonstrated that by one day, there's an increase in the proportion of G actin, suggesting that actin is destabilized. Now, after two days of floating culture, um, there's less green signal. So this suggests to us that total actin actually decreases. Um, but what you do see, and what I found really interesting, is that if you look at a single optical slice, the cells are probably even more rounder and smaller than they were at one day. So indeed, we do see actin changes um, within two days of culturing cells or, or tendons in the understimulated or stress-deprived condition. Now, looking at gene expression, we found that when we looked at the tenogenic molecules, collagen type 1, tenase and C, alpha and scleraxis, by maintaining the tendons in floating cultures at one or two day, there was a decrease in the expression of collagen type 1, tenase and C, alpha and scleraxis, these tenogenic genes. 
We did not see an effect on the chondrogenic genes, but what we did see an effect on, or we also saw, saw an effect on, was the expression of matrix metalloproteins three. Um, there is a large increase in the expression of um, matrix metalloproteinase 3. Um, we didn't see an increase in matrix metalloproteinase 13. However, it was trending by day two. Um, so this suggested to us that there were, there were tendinosis-like changes. It didn't recapitulate tendinosis completely because we didn't see an increase in chondrogenic genes or um, the proteases, but a subset of the genes were affected, namely the tenogenic molecules and MMP3. So what we wanted to figure out next is whether or not there was a late relationship between actin stability and tendinosis like gene expression, as well as how is actin stability actually attained in tendon cells. For this, we looked at actin binding molecules and the molecule that we're interested in is as I alluded to in my introduction, tropomyosin. So the question is what stabilizes F actin in tenocytes? We suspect or we hypothesize that it is tropomyosin. Now again, tropomyosins are F-actin binding proteins that bind along F-actin to stabilize F-actin. Interestingly, there are over 40 non-redundant isoforms of tropomyosin that exist from alternative splicing from just four tropomyosin genes. Now the particular tropomyosin expressed by cells are important and actually determine how F-actin is organized within cells by regulating other actin binding proteins onto F-actin. For instance, here, tropomyosin 1.9 binds along the F-actin at the cell-to-cell -cell junctions of epithelial cells here. However, if you stimulate these epithelial cells to undergo EMT to form F-actin stress fibers, another tropomyosin isoform becomes expressed 2.1, which alters the actin structure to form F-actin stress fibers. So this stabilizes F-actin structures in stress fibers. This stabilizes cortical F-actin. So this demonstrates to us that the type of tropomyosin is important in cells. We sought to determine which tropomyosin is expressed in tenocytes. So our hypothesis for the study, I'll return to this, is tenocyte tropomyosin stabilizes the actin that works and prevent actin depolarization. Well, which tropomyosins are expressed in cells? So we isolated um, tail tenocytes, Achilles, uh, oh, sorry, tail tendons, Achilles tendons, and parteris tendons, excuse me. We performed semi-quantitative RT-PCR, we ran gels, we looked at all 40 isoforms of tropomyosin, um, and we looked to see which tropomyosin isoforms were consistent between all three um, tendons. We found that tropomyosin 1.6, 3.1, and 4.2 were expressed in all, all, all tendons that we studied. Um, we, tend, we, we then focused on tropomycin 3.1. We do have knockout mice for tropomycin 3.1, and there's chemical inhibitors um, toward tropomycin 3.1. So it serves as a good starting point for our investigations on tropomycin in tenocytes. If you stain for tropomycin 3.1 um, in, the, in the tenocytes, um, they, they co-localize, or tropomycin 3.1 co-localizes with F-actin. If you take a higher magnification, um, view of this boxed region here, you can see really that tropomycin is along that F-actin fiber. If you do a line scan analysis, so just draw a line on image J across uh, this F-actin, you can see here that the signal intensity of tropomycin 3.1 overlaps with that of F-actin, demonstrating that they are co-localized and um, suggesting that they associate. So as I mentioned, there is a drug to inhibit tropomycin. This is TR100, which binds to the C-terminus of tropomycin 3.1. It prevents the assembly of um, F tropomycin 3.1 stabilized F-actin structures. So if you treat with TR100, those, those um, F-actin filaments that are stabilized by tropomycin 3.1 will begin to depolymerize over time. We determined that um, Concentrations of T100 up to five micromolars are pretty good in keeping the cells alive. So we, we stuck to, to concentrations below five micromolars. So we, we took isolated tail tenocytes and we placed them in culture. Um, what you see here is that when you treat with TR100, the inhibi inhibitor to TPM 3.1, the cells eventually begin to round up and they begin to become smaller. So we, we did quantitative image analysis by tracing these individual cells. 
you'll see there's a decrease in the size of the cells, and there's also an increase in um, there's also an uh, increase in circularity, meaning that the cells are more circular, um, which you can see here. This, this mimics what happens during tendinosis and is similar to what we found with our SYNAP model, as well as our understimulation ex vivo model. So TR100 causes cells um, to round up. In addition, we looked at F-actin structure here. Um, so this is our control condition, which was just treated with DMSO alone. Um, the cells have stress fibers, and you can see in our higher magnification images, TPM 3.1 um, co-localizes along those stress fibers. With two micromolars, there's less TPM along those stress fibers, but with five micromolars, there are no longer stress fibers, and tropomycin is no longer associated with the stress fibers since they don't exist. Tropomycin 3.1 is now um, co-localized with the cortical F-actin structures, which was also quite interesting because it did not inhibit sort of the association with F-actin, but um, rather changed the organization of F-actin. Now, this is another study. This is unpublished, um, but we took a co-culture of cells that came from tails derived from tropomycin wild-type mice or tropomycin knockout mice. We mixed them in a 50-50 ratio and then seeded them in glass dishes. Uh, we stained them from tropomycin. Um, so that we can identify which came from the wild type mice. And you can see here, the, the, these cells stain for tropomycin. So we presume that these are from the wild type mice. And we compared the stress fibers in, um, that are positive, in cells that are positive for tropomycin from the wild type mice versus those that come from the knockout mice. And what you see here is that those cells that express tropomycin have a greater degree of F-actin stress fibers. Um, as compared to those that did not have tropomyosin 3.1, as shown here in these middle population of cells. Again, suggesting that it's important for regulating stress fiber formation. We also performed um, triton solubility to determine the proportion of G to F actin using biochemistry. And what you see here, so this is very similar to a Western lot if you're not familiar with West Capri electrophoresis. Um, you see the spectra of signals, so it's run on a capillary um, and the system picks up um, the chemiluminescence off of the capillary. This is molecular weight on the x-axis here, and this chemiluminescence on the y-axis. What you see here, when we look at G-actin, um, there's more G-actin in tier 100 treated cells, less F-actin in tier 100 treated cells. And this is um, also shown here in our pseudoblot. So you can see with five micromolars, there's more G-actin and slightly less F-actin. Uh, with five micromolars treatment. If you do um, a ratio metric analysis of GDF actin, you see that by five micromolars, there's a significant increase in the proportion of GDF actin, suggesting that actin is destabilized and depolymerized. Now, with regard to gene expression, what we found was that there's a decrease in the expression of tenogenic genes, an increase this time in chondrogenic genes, and an increase in protease expression, um, which is recapitulating tendinosis quite nicely. So we believe that this actin destabilization, depolarization results in um, tendinosis-like gene expression changes. Um, this is also consistent at the protein level. So we did West Coast electrophoresis. We found that there's a decrease in alpha actin, an increase in matrix metalloproteinase 3. Um, we also applied stretch on the tendon. This was work carried out by uh, Rola Musa Vizide, who's a vi visiting scientist, as well as Valerie West in my lab. Um, we applied stretch by restraining the tendons. Now, it's very difficult to um, suspend weights onto these mouse tail tendons. Those previous studies were done using rat. So we developed this this way by just restraining the tendons under magnets. By applying restraining stretch on the tendons, <clears throat> we found that F-actin was preserved and there was um, a decrease in the production of matrix metalloproteinase 3. Under the stretch condition, if you treat with TR100, there's an increase in matrix metalloproteinase 3, leading to the suggestion that actin destabilization results in the regulation of genes. So the next question um, that I'm going to, to quickly address here, as I know that time is running out, are what are the regulators of gene expression downstream of actin? So we know that actin regulates um, tendinosis like changes, but what actually, how, how is it connected? How is actin destabilization and depolymerization regulating genes? 
For this, um, we looked at a transcription factor called myocardial related transcription factor. And for this signaling mechanism, MRTF exists in the nucleus of cells bound to the promoter region of cells. Um, in this case, there's a lot of F actin in cells. There's some G actin, but not much. However, when there is a, a actin destabilization or depolymerization, there's an increase in the proportion of G actin. Now, MRTF has a high affinity for G actin. So when there's a large proportion of G actin, it enters the nucleus, binds to MRTF, resulting in the export of MRTF. MRTF um, export results in a decrease in interaction with its coactivator SRF, reducing the expression of SRF target genes such as COL1 and alpha spinosal actin. The effect of MRTF on scleraxis or MP3 gene expression has not been tested in any other cells to my knowledge. So this is something that we were quite interested in. So this work was conducted um, by Valerie West and Matt Ebron in my lab. Um, what we first found was that if we treated with TR100, there was nuclear export of MRTF. So again, it's highly, um, MRTF is a high affinity to G actin. So MRTF is exported into the cytoplasm of cells. As you can see here, we did nuclear cytoplasmic analysis. So we just circled the entire cell, circled the nucleus and calculated the proportion of, uh, of fluorescent intensity in the nucleus versus cytoplasm. And we found that by tier, treatment with TR100, there's a decrease in MRTF. Um, in a similar fashion, we also destabilized F-actin or depolymerized F-actin um, directly by treating with latrunculin. So latrunculin is, binds to monomeric actin and, and it prevents the assembly of F-actin structures, which eventually leads to the net depolymerization of F-actin, resulting in an increase in G-actin um, which we would suspect to pull out MRTF from the nucleus of cells. And that's what it did. So you can see here, MRTFs in green. There's more MRTF in the nucleus in this condition as compared to here where nuclei again are in blue. Um, there's less MRTF in the nuclei here as well as here. So there's nuclear export of MRTF. Um, oh, this was backwards, but this is actually cytoplasmic to nuclear fluorescence. And what you see here is that there's an increase in cytoplasmic um, MRTF. In addition, by treating with latrunculin, similar effects um, to what was seen with TR100 was shown. There's a reduction in tenogenic gene expression, an increase in the matrix metalloprotease, and an increase in SOX9 uh, gene expression. So really recapitulating what happens with tendinosis. Um, so perhaps MRTF signaling is involved. <clears throat> what we did next is we specifically targeted MRTF by treating with CCG1423 which inhibits nuclear import of MRTF. So what you see here is that in control cells, there's a lot of MRTF in the nucleus. We did not affect actin structure as much as we did with latrunculin. Um, there's still stress fibers in these cells, but what you see here is that there's less MRTF in the nucleus of cells. We did nuclear to cytoplasmic uh, ratio metric analysis. There was a decrease in the amount of nuclear fluorescence. And when we looked at gene expression, what we found was that there was a decrease in tenogenic gene expression, tenacin C, collagen 1, scleraxis, and alpha spinosactin mRNA levels. There was no effect, however, on protease expression or chondrogenic expression, showing to us that MRTF um, regulates the expression of tenogenic genes, but not protease or chondrogenic genes. We looked at the expression at the protein level of collagen 1, um, and we found that the effect on collagen 1 is consistent at the protein level. Uh, this was also done for, via West Capilli electrophoresis, um, and we quantified this, founding that there was a significant decrease in collagen type 1. So this suggests that for the regulation of protease and chondrogenic gene expression via actin, this may be through mechanisms independent of MRTF. So in summary, F-actin is destabilized by Planteris overload in our SYNAB model. F-actin is destabilized during tendon stress deprivation, which corresponds to aspects of tendinosis like gene modulation, and directly destabilization, destabilizing F-actin by TPM 3.1 um, leads to tendinosis like gene expression changes, which we also confirmed via treatment with latrunculin. So 
I hope to have conveyed to you using an in vivo, our in vivo studies that overload these cellular understimulation due to loss of matrix cell interaction with our ex vivo model that the cellular understimulation leads to destabilization of actin stability, which is regulated by tropomyosin 3.1, resulting in tendinosis like gene expression changes, resulting in matrix breakdown, and with our in vitro studies that tropomyosin really regulates actin stability to regulate matrix breakdown. And this is due in part due to MRTF, but also that other pathways that have not yet been identified are involved. So the translational impact of this work is if we can understand how we can modulate actin stability, potentially through tropomyosin 3.1, can we actually stabilize F actin to prevent tendinosis progression? And this is sort of what we want to understand next. So that, that concludes my presentation. I do want to acknowledge um, those in my lab that have worked on the 10 projects, um, the people here, namely Cam, Rola, Val, um, and Matt, um, who conducted most of this work, um, and other lab members that don't work in, uh, in tendon but have um, contributed to useful discussions. Uh, Don Elliott's lab, um, particularly Ellen Bloom and Lily Lin, who have helped us with, with our experiments. Um, as well as conduct uh, the in vivo experiments. And this research is supported by um, a Delaware Center for Musculoskeletal Research grant, um, as well as a R01 uh, to, to the PI Don Elliott, as well as myself. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Perino, for that excellent presentation. We really appreciate it. Wonderful findings. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump right into the questions again. I encourage our audience who is still online here to ask your questions in the chat box, and I will convey them verbally to Dr. Perenno. We do have uh, our first question here is from Anita Zaremba, if I pronounce that right, Anita. And Anita is asking a very basic question. I think you may have alluded to it already, um, but other than like rehab-related efforts, is tendinosis like reversible or possibly treatable medically? I mean, can you give us just a little um, perspective on the therapeutic nature there? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think there's a certain, uh, well, this is probably best um, answered. This probably would be best answered by our collaborator, uh, Karen Sibernagel, who's also part of that R01 grant. Um, but from what I get to them, yes, it, it, it is reversible. Um, likely if it's caught early enough. Uh, so yeah, I, that would be my answer to the question, but uh, I'm not a clinician, so I don't want to speak to that too much. <laughs> sure, sure, no worries at all. And we have a good question here from Karanavir Saini, if I pronounce that right, Karanavir. Please comment on the kinetics of f and protein under load deprivation. Yeah, yeah, so um, we, we haven't really understood we haven't really done um, the studies to address this yet, um, but we intend to. Um, by, by kinetics of F-actin um, during low deprivation, my guess is you're interested in understanding what's happening in a dynamic sense. Um, and to, to study this, I think we need to study what happens in live cells and we needed the tools to, to do that. So now we, we do have um, mice that express uh, life act GFP. Um, this will allow us to understand what happens when we stress the prive tendons, what happens to the F-actin um, in, in one cell um, over time. So I think that that's what's required in order for us to understand that. We do understand that stress deprivation by one day leads to changes in F-actin. We don't know how quick those changes happen. In my opinion, I think that those changes happen pretty quickly, um, but we just have not tested that yet. Great. Looking forward to those findings. Uh, let me just ask a couple of questions. These are more gene regulation related, and you may have mentioned this, Dr. Prince, so forgive me um, if you've already answered this, but um, the MRTF, you had mentioned or suggested that scleraxis may be downstream of MRTF and the genetic regulation. Um, did you identify like any SRF sites in the scleraxis promoters or enhancer elements which might suggest that Scleraxis is a direct target of MRTF? We have not yet done that um, experimentally um, in the biomechanical or 
bioinformatics sense, yes, mm -hmm. uh, there, there is an SRF binding site. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we haven't tested that experimentally, whether or not MRTF and SRF um, bind to the pro specific region of the promoter region to, to regulate um, scleraxis. Um, so, so that is something that um, we would be interested in doing. Yeah, just like a chip pull down exchange yeah. or something. Yeah. Like that. yeah. Chip uh, and, stuff. and then I think, if I understood it correctly, some of the MMPs go up in expression upon load or tendinosis, and then others are down regulated. Um, are any of the MMPs, do they have like EBOX motifs in their enhancers or promoter elements that might suggest sclerosis binds directly to those targets? Good question. Um, I'm not sure, to be completely honest. Uh, I haven't looked. So basically, our, we found that MRTF did not regulate the matrix metalloprotease. So we, we tended mm -hmm. to focus on what it did regulate and, and try to understand the mechanisms there. But we're also interested in understanding what regulates um, the matrix metalloproteases, um, what, what mechanisms actin uses to regulate that. Um, one mechanism that has been alluded to by another group um, at UPenn is uh, YAPTAS. Mm -hmm. um, so YAPTAS signaling actin can also regulate the localization of YAPTAS, mm -hmm. uh, which does bind um, to to the promoter regions of matrix metalloproteases. So that might be an alternative mechanisms or mechanism to regulate gene expression um, by actin. Okay, great, great. Yeah, I'm just fascinated by it. I, just a little plug here. I was delighted to hear the term scleraxis. I hadn't heard that in many years. And I actually was the one who discovered that BHLH transcription factor back at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center in the early 90s. So Really? Wow, that's great. It's so cool that you're studying it. I have yeah. <laughs> really? I'm a big BHLH transcription factor guy, so I'm, oh, I'm okay. delighted to see that name today. Very cool. Very cool. Hey, that's yeah. great. <laughs> no worries. Uh, all right. Well, I think we're done with the questions and stuff, Dr. Perino. We'll go ahead and finish up just a few minutes early. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all the attendees. We had a great turnout today, and just very briefly, I have to say where everybody was from. Uh, the United States, Philadelphia, and specifically uh, Lilith Elmore, who is my colleague, based out of the East Coast, a regional account executive there, and I believe, Dr. Perino, she invited you to give this talk, so that's cool. Thank you, Lilith, for that contact. Uh, also, from India, we have folks, as well as Cleveland. South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Nepal. I was just in Nepal a few months ago, love that country. The People's Democratic Republic of Congo, Algeria, Colombia, Ukraine. Of course, many folks from Bel Delaware, I wonder why. <laughs> and also Yemen. So thank you to all the attendees. We had a great turnout. Dr. Perano, I want to thank you as well. Really enjoyed your presentation. Congratulations to you and your team there um, on all your success um, studying this regulation and tendinosis is just fascinating. Um, and I just thank my colleague, Max Fleckman as well to finish up. Max is the one who organizes and executes all of our online webinars and he always does a great job, so. With that, thanks again to everybody and good night and good evening or good morning, wherever you may be. Great, thank you.